the very roots of eating, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is the whole state of things, a pure violence without object anymore. This is the typical violence of Violence because what happens there is the murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Welcome to Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins, as always, sponsored by the People's Institute for Revolutionary Semiotics. Before we introduce our guests today, we want to just mention we have a Patreon at patreon.com forward slash M-U-H-H. Consider leaving us a dollar a month there, or if not, maybe send us a sweet review on iTunes. We'd appreciate that. But today, we bring in you Gail Newman and Mari Rudy. Gail is chair of the Center for Global Languages, Literature, and Cultures and is the Harold J. Henry Professor of German at Williams College. Her research includes interests include psychoanalytic theory, German lit, and culture, and she's published on Goethe, Kleist, Hoffman, and Novalis, among many others, including a book titled Locating the Romantic Subject, Novalis with Winnicott. Mari is Distinguished Professor of Critical Theory and Gender and Sexuality Studies at the University of Toronto. Her books include The Singularity of Being, Lacan and the Immortal Within, The Ethics of Opting Out, Defiance and Affect in Queer Theory, and Penis Envy and Other Bad Feelings, The Emotional Cause of Everyday Life. We just want to send you both a very Hardy Machinic, welcome to the podcast. It's thrilling to have you both. And this is kind of interesting because this will be the first time we've really had, I think, two people yep. who have co authored a book on the same book. So this should be fun. We lost you, Taylor, <laughs> by the way. No, I'm, I'm still here. I'm okay, still here. gotcha. I just wanted to welcome both of you. And, and I think it's the first time we've had two guests, as Coop said, that are that we're interviewing rather than it being, a, if you will, a roundtable. So we, we welcome you both. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah, thank you for the invitation very much. First of all, we want to get to the, the book that you shared with us today that's forthcoming against neoliberal self-optimization, Marion Milner and D.W. Winnicott, which, you know, I found fascinating and we can talk more about that. But I do want to give you both a chance, whoever wants to jump in first, to talk about sort of your own experience, whether it be anecdotal or whether you have some, a little bit of a roadmap telling us how you got into whatever we want to call it, critical theory, philosophy, literature, just how you got into academia, whatever it is that you want to tell us, give us a little bit of your sort of origin story, as we like to call it. I could come up with a very long origin story, but I'll try to keep <laughs> this brief. Um I will say that I grew up in a three-house village in the southeast of Finland, in a house that had no running water or central heating, in a very poor kind of a, almost a, not even a working class family, but yeah, very kind of dispossessed family. And somehow, miraculously from that, I made a jump to the US Ivies, first Brown and then Harvard. And the uh, one thing that is kind of relevant to our discussion today is that I was tracked to be a social scientist. I entered Harvard in sociology, thinking that I was going to be a sociologist. And then one day I randomly stumbled upon a course taught by Alice Turdeen in the 1990s. Uh, she was at Harvard teaching, she's actually still at Harvard teaching theory. At that point, uh, she had kind of recently published her book, Gynesis, for which she's famous. And so right. was in this course that had a little, little bit of Lacan, a little bit of Derrida, Foucault, Christeva, Erigay, Sixu, all those people. And she hooked me in like four hours, the first two weeks of lectures. I became so convinced that I had to study this stuff in detail that I, that I actually I finished my sociology MA and then I reapplied to Harvard to the complete program. And I had no idea how I actually got in because I had no background in the humanities, but somehow I got in and then I just devoured theory for the for the following seven years. I was in, I was in grad school forever. And I took every theory class conceivable and then <laughs> very quickly started to teach it myself mm -hmm. because for financial re reasons, because I had, I had switched fields, they made me pay. Um, 
I didn't, they didn't make me pay tuition, but I lost my kind of fellowship funding. So I had to start supporting myself by teaching. And suddenly I was, <laughs> I was teaching courses for Barbara Johnson and Alice Trudine. And it was one of those right. things where I was just handed a syllabus at the beginning of the semester and told to teach it in the sections, the discussion sections. So I was teaching all this stuff that I had never read before, like an entire book by Derrida or an entire book by Lacan. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand half of what I was teaching, <laughs> but I think I understood just a little of bit course. more than my students always. But yeah, it was a struggle to keep ahead of them. That's how I learned theory, by teaching it. Trial by fire, right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It was terrifying. There's no better way though to learn it than to have to try to put it in your own words and i think that that's part of what we try to do here where we always try to stay a little bit of ahead of of our own uh you know of our own ignorance and <laughs> and i think that being uh forced to sort of verbalize it and to think through it even when we make mistakes we can if you're honest with yourself, which I try to be, I, I try to point out to Coop, I say, I, I'll be like, no, you were totally <laughs> right. I was wrong. I do this all the time, but I do think that that's part of the learning process and you learn more from your, from your failures. So being forced, again, that's trial by fire and that's that's admirable. And uh, now Gail, do you have a, a story that you feel like you can share with us too and how maybe you sure. got <laughs> interested in German? I know that I saw that you were uh, at the university you went to the University of Minnesota for yeah. your degrees, which I, I have to give credit for in terms of their press, especially yeah. because I, I kind of started off in comparative literature and literary mm -hmm. theory, and they, they've they had a wonderful sort of run of publishing. Yeah. So, yeah. Exactly. And it started, well, I have lots of connections to what you were just talking about. The, the press, that series started right as I was finishing graduate school and my- oh dissertation advisor, my doctor father, my doctor father, as they say in the German speaking world, together with Vlad Godzig, who was chair of, of Complit at the time, founded the series. But I'm, I'm also really resonating with your description of the sort of learning, teaching, trying, failing dynamic mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. learning and teaching foreign language. I really think that every bit of my work, both my scholarship and my and my teaching, regardless of whether it has to do with German specifically, is very connected with the experience over and over again of working with people who are who are taking that big risk of trying to express themselves without especially adults, you know, older right. people who are taking the risk of going into a space that's not familiar to them and that they can't do and yet nonetheless trying to to say something. And I, I'm very humbled, humbled by my students all the time. As far as my own origins in the in the field are concerned, you know, unlike Mari, I grew up in a middle class household, a, an American household, I guess sort of suburban. Mm -hmm. Actually we're sort of exurb of um, Albany, New York. Pretty okay. rural, but you know, not not on a farm. And, <laughs> uh, my my parents were both educated. My mother's parents had also gone to college and one of them had an advanced degree. So technically, I grew up in an educated household, but in lived reality, uh, it was a completely unintellectual or even not consciously or intentionally, but effectively anti-intellectual household. I was, right. sports was the thing. And mm -hmm. in my house. And so I felt I didn't have really any outlet. I didn't even know I had academic interests. I, I just, you know, went to school and did what I was told. I was actually a musician first, first okay. and foremost. I, I was a very serious clarinetist. I sometimes think if I had played a string instrument, I might still be a musician. <laughs> I didn't really like the clarinet. <laughs> but it was my only option, either that or flute, because when I was learned, you know, when I was in in elementary school, girls weren't allowed to play brass instruments and there were no string what? instruments in the school. Oh no. So I had the choice between flute and clarinet and it's like, that's obvious. So I took clarinet, but anyway, I was a clarinetist and I went to conservatory, right. I went to the Northwestern School of Music first and realized pretty quickly that I had, by the people who were surrounding me, that I had neither the talent nor the temperament to be a professional musician. And with regard to music, I had no interest in teaching it. I only wanted right. to play it. So then I had to be like, what am I going to do instead? And I remembered a really good high school German teacher 
So I knew I wanted to do humanities literature of some sort, but my English teacher was eh, and my German teacher was great. And <laughs> so I, similar to Mari, I had to apply to the College of Arts and Sciences at Northwestern. I had to transfer from the conservatory to the College of Arts and Sciences. And Mari said she went to graduate school forever. I went to undergrad forever because I those orchestra rehearsals just didn't count toward the BA. Right. Yeah. And then then the rest is is sort of history. I I went into German studies and uh, as far as theory is concerned, I was very anti-theory. I was afraid of theory in graduate school. I had one or two maybe complete course. I had a, I had a complete course with Vlad Godzig, and I was so intimidated and put off, mostly intimidated by the other students, the mm-hmm. theory types. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. this was in the eighties that I couldn't even really concentrate on what the professor was teaching us because I was just so I felt so stupid mm. and it was only only later that I re, it was Lacan because that was all you did it, it, right okay that's all you did in psychoanalysis at that time mm-hmm. and it was only later that I realized how valuable Lacan was and it was it was when I discovered Winnicott on my own once I was already an assistant professor that mm-hmm. I started to open up toward psychoanalysis and then by extension theory more. And now it's very much a part of my work and life. I mean, I think that's wonderful. I just to share, I had a a similar experience when I was first in grad school at the University of Iowa. I came in probably as the youngest person in my class, which I now, on the one hand, I would not redo it, but on the other hand, you know, you are the sum of your experiences. And so that failure it has helped to kind of mold me. But I came in at 18 and felt like I had a kind of grasp on some of the theoretical things, but I was I was very much despised by my peers in the class. We, it was like a class of maybe 25, 26. I just remember being routinely kind of openly silenced and I'm not gonna say threatened that's not the right word but sort of bully is not the right word either but I was I was kind of put in my place in class whenever I would try to raise a point to discuss and of course I think the professors may have gotten a sense of the vibe but may not have known how I was feeling so that didn't last long I was there for a year and I, I came back home and then later I have that feeling of being in class and not wanting to raise, not wanting to speak out because of knowing the reaction I might get. Because I learned very quickly if I, if I talked in class, I was going to be embarrassed, not for what I said, but for what what the people said. So, and I hate that that has to be a vibe, but we, we know that that can be a vibe in academia at conferences. For example, we know that there's going to be People wanting to hear their own voice at the end of the conference, asking a a long-winded question that really has nothing to do with the talk. We see some of this kind of grandstanding or this, what's the word? I won't say ego, but this kind of... um, Arrogance or muscle muscle flexing, I call it. Yes, muscle flexing, one 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 upmanship. Yeah. So the fact that, uh, that I experienced that... I will say I was still young, you know, 18, but I was in grad school. I, I probably shouldn't have been, but, you know, I was, I had a passion for literature theory, you know, because that's how I got the theory bug was doing an English degree and then getting into the up to get to the upper echelon, the the junior senior classes, we had to take what's called practical criticism, where it's then you're applying Lacan, you're you're looking at the Norton anthology of criticism and theory, and you're, you're actually doing more than you're doing more than just the basic essays. You're, you're actually trying to read Derrida and Lacan and these other things. And maybe it's haphazardly applied, but I think that way of knowing, oh, wait, there's a lot of different ways to approach the same text. That just made me almost exuberant. And um, now, Marie and what you said, Gail, I've been there not wanting to speak out or feeling like maybe I shouldn't speak out. And um, I hate that that's, that's such a trope in. Um, in academia, but I do think that it's probably more common than we would like to admit. Extremely common. Yeah, as someone who teaches critical theory, I have to, I'd have to grapple with that issue as an instructor on the graduate mm-hmm. level, because uh, pretty much every year, because I teach Lacan and I teach Zizek specifically, every year I tend to get at least one, usually a young guy, who uh, at the beginning of the semester makes it very known that he is the master of the universe and tries right. to 
walk, right. all, walk all, all over me as a as a female professor. And I, <laughs> over the years, I have developed this tactic of of this tactic of just completely, utterly humiliating and destroying him in this usually the second session. In the first session, I kind of scout out who it is, and then right, <laughs> right, 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 right. In the second session, I destroy him because I know that if I don't, he's gonna dominate the rest of the semester and yeah. ruin the, the seminar for everyone else. And I have literally had female students come up to me after class and say something like, "Oh my God, thank you so much, Professor Ruti, for doing that because <laughs> I've had that guy in, in my other classes." And he's right. <laughs> <laughs> they migrate. Yeah. And on the flip side of it, you know, I mean, I think the students like the one you're saying you were Taylor. It, mm-hmm. It's um, I think for every one of those guys, Mari, there's there mm-hmm. are five at least yep. people who don't trust themselves to speak, even if it's in their native language. <laughs> right. I'm not just talking about my language classes, but also my comp lit classes because they're of whatever, because of personality or because they're first gen or because they're from underrepresented groups or they've had experiences with guys like that you're talking about before, or they're just, you know, whatever. And it's equally tricky to draw out and sort of make this like little micro safe space for those people and say, okay, I'm looking at you. I see you. I, yes. My eyes are on you and you can talk and I'm not going to let anything happen to you as it is to turn to the other ones and, you know, do the the black belt move that... <laughs> <laughs> I've seen Mari do this, not in class, obviously, because I'm I haven't been a student of hers, but I've seen her do it with uh, colleagues, and it's a beautiful sight to behold because it simultaneously, <laughs> you know, does the trick, but doesn't doesn't humiliate. You say humiliate, but it doesn't humiliate to the point of making of awakening the danger that the person is. You know, we all know from like Vladimir Putin that humiliated <laughs> people are very dangerous, right? Yes. I mean, Yes, that's true. But it's never like that where they're going to become dangerous and kind of try to strike back. But it it does the trick. (laughs) It makes a lot of sense, Marie, what you're saying and Gail, that you do have to also think about the other students that are that are quiet. From my perspective, it was none of the it wasn't the necessarily that that I was trying to be master. Obviously, at 18 and just being exposed, I had a lot of I was still flowering I, and I had a lot of interest and I, I had no, by no means was I performing mastery or any, of any kind. It was just more or less, I think that what was interesting is that the students in my class hated me. The students that were older and that were finishing up their degrees tried to mentor me and they kind of took on to me. So I think it was a kind of rivalry thing that perhaps I had to navigate. And if I would have been older, I think I would have not allowed myself to be silenced. I think still being young and still not necessarily knowing my voice and knowing my my personality, I allow that, that to happen. But again, this is one of those things where, and Marie, you talk about this in your part of the book, especially early on, where those failures help to make who we are. And so we can regret maybe the particular feelings that are intense and that, that I can remember. But at the same time, without that experience, I think that, you know, I may not have opened my eyes to the reality of of certain of dealing with other people, whether it be academia or just being an adult or just in any sort of intellectual exchange that made me grow up (laughs) pretty fast. Very true. I'm extremely introverted, which is the funny dynamic. I wonder if that would even be something interesting because we're sort of pairs of creative partners and Mm -hmm. a lot of our discussion Mm -hmm. today is going to center around creativity. And I think, I don't know, maybe I wonder, I even asked Taylor earlier this week, not even thinking about this until I got later into the book about, you know, what his Myers-Briggs type was. I'm INTJ. And I was curious what Taylor's was. Can you explain that? My students talk about this all the time. I, they exchange them like you're doing, but I don't know the designations. Could you? I don't either. Well, I don't know them all. I mean, it goes back to the whole union. 16 archetypical personality traits oh, or whatever, boy. but it's something like I is introverted, N I think is intuition, Okay, and then T is thinking, and J is judging. Okay. And then you have other, you also have judgment, you have P, which would be, be perceivers rather than judgers. I see. And then I think there's extroverted thinking, there's introverted thinking, mm-hmm. there's extroverted intuition, there's introverted <laughs> intuition, so it's yeah. kind of like- Lots of combinations. It sounds like astrological signs, right? I mean, yeah, like, I mean, it, it sort of 
It kind Luke of very much is because I mean a lot of I think it's funny <laughs> because a lot of the INTJ traits are very much like in the same cluster as a Scorpio, which is Taylor and I actually both born on the same day and both yep. Scorpios. I mean, in a certain way, we are very sympathetic, maybe opposites attract, but I guess I'm the extrovert. I'm the the sort of exuberant one, and Coop is more of the the quiet, speak softly, carry a big stick kind of thing. Yeah. yeah uh, so I think that that's the interesting part is that we're born on the same day, but we have. We have complementary aspects of that, but I will have to take that test, Coop, now that you asked, because when you asked me yesterday, I was like, I have no fucking clue. I'll have to figure it out. Introversion is not necessarily that you're quiet per se, but that you, it's more about your energy levels and how you are drained by more social interaction than, because, you know, obviously, you know me with my goofy comedy stuff that I'm always doing. I'm certainly not, not necessarily quiet all the time. I you're mean, more quiet than I am. I we're talking say. about ourselves too much, I think. No, 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 no. <laughs> this is, this is, we're just getting started. And I will say, you know, off the top of my head, I know that one of the first questions I just added, it's not even a question. It was just a request. I think maybe for the listener, just to get us going. I wanted to ask Marie with your piece, since it came first in terms of order, if we could talk a little bit about one of the themes that shows up early about the, the difference that you put forward between sort of Lacan's notion of a constitutive ontological lack, or really it's also related to loss and these other things, versus these more context-specific forms of lack, which as I kind of, in my head, this is, I know this is just adding on, but I, I thought of it as Deleuze and Guattari, they critique Sartre for starting with scarcity, right, which is kind of produced in their point of view. So I wanted to maybe talk about that difference, those two types of sort of lack, uh, one being sort of existentially constitutive and the other being more, I guess, I mean, you say context specific, which I think is helpful, but I'm trying to think of another way of putting it being, uh, we could just say part of our throneness, as Heidegger might say, right? We, you know. Anyway, let's discuss that. That's perfect. Proneness is a very good term. And I also very much like the way you phrase it, a distribution of lack or scarcity by means of capitalism. That's a really good way to describe it. So this distinction between ontological lack and what I call context specific or circumstantial type of lack is something that I have always talked about in my pretty much every book of mine, uh, because it's really important to me that people understand the distinction. And this really has to do with the origin story that I just told you, namely that right. I come from a very poor background. And so I have never been able to forget about the distribution of life that has to do with capitalism specifically. Mm-hmm. In all of my work, I always make this distinction. Basically, there's the lack in being or the nothingness within us that Lacan talks about and a lot of other theorists talk about, a lot of Lacanians refer to the lack in being. This ontological void or nothingness at the core of our being that basically gives rise to desire, gives rise to the attempt to fill fill the lack within our being. That's one level of lack for me. And then the other level is this kind of a context-specific level that has to do with socioeconomic and other kinds of inequalities that has to do with, say, racism or sexism or homophobia or poverty that is socially, structurally constituted, is created by social inequalities. And it has always been really important important to me that people understand that I'm sort of operating on both of these levels at once. And one reason this is really, really important to to spell out is that I think a lot of the divisions in contemporary theory have to do with the fact that people are talking past each other precisely because they're talking on these two different levels of lack. So you get a lot of Lacanians and Zizekians. Right talking on the ontological level, and then you get a lot of affect theorists and uh, uh, queer theorists and feminist theorists and post-colonial studies uh, folks and people in critical race theory, all the, quote unquote, all the other progressive critical theory types, they are mostly talking on the context specific level. Mm -hmm. And so what happens a lot is that people don't understand each other because they're talking on two different levels. And Lacanians in particular have a tendency to not really, quote unquote, get why it is that so many other progressive critics angry at them. Mm. And it's very (laughs) simple. It's simply the fact that 
these other folks, non-Lacanian critical theorists, uh, they think that the sort of everyday level of lack, the context-specific level of lack is actually more important because it hurts more. It has more direct consequences on your life. You know, being ontologically wounded by the signifier is not that difficult to bear in the large scheme of things uh, <laughs> when you compare it with, you know, poverty or racism or something like that. Right. I have made a point of always emphasizing these two different levels because I want to make sure that the um, context specific doesn't get lost in the fray. And the reason I started this particular book or this particular chapter with this distinction, distinction is that I wanted to make it clear that Milner, so my chapter focuses on Marion Milner, the um, kind of mm-hmm. 1930s uh, through the 1980s psychoanalytic and kind of experimental writer, Marion Milner. I wanted to make sure that readers understood from the get-go that when Milner talks about self-loss or lack or dispossession, she is functioning on the ontological level in the same way as Lacan is. Mm -hmm. She's not really talking about social inequalities, and I wanted to make that clear. It was nice that we could see this also in Gail's piece. Gail, you start off with talking about Citizens United and how the, the sort of you say the primacy of the individual is at the heart of this connection of what economic capitalism and liberal political philosophy. You say it becomes clear that the vaunted pursuit of happiness is closely intertwined with the pursuit of profit and liberty with open markets, which already we see also in Marie's discussion. So I, I guess that we can see these themes sort of interweaving throughout your your narratives, which I think is part of the the way that the the book succeeds in my view is having these resonances so do you feel like do you want to add anything to yeah. this this part yeah i think i would um first i'll start with the concrete and then, mm-hmm. then say something a little more i don't know theoretical i guess but i witnessed exactly the kind of talking past each other and the fallout the deeply emotional fallout of that talking past each other at a, at a conference that I go to hmm. and actually the conference where I met Mari and not, oh. not it wasn't the iteration of the conference that I met Mari but it's called it's the uh, for the Asso- association for the psychoanalysis of culture and society I met Mari at one of those many years ago but I was I was there a few years ago before covid maybe the year before covid mm-hmm. and it was exactly the scenario that Mari's describing where even though everyone there does some form of psychoanalysis, either as clinicians or as academics from all over the world, still, there was a panel on race, Mm -hmm. and they were discussing a book by a Lacanian critical race theorist. Mm -hmm. And people who were non-Lacanian were deeply, deeply hurt and offended by what the Lacanian author was talking about. Oh, the author was there, as were some other Lacanians who were talking with, you know, sort of in the same register that Mari was saying, and then others who were not. And there was that same kind of surprise on the part of Lacan, like, well, why are you hating on me so much? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the others were, why are you attacking us? I mean, literally, they felt attacked. And it was okay. it had to do with the word enjoyment. And I remember vividly, you know, as a white person witnessing this, it was, I mean, well, it has nothing to do with me. I'm just reporting it. But it was the notion of enjoyment was interpreted by the non-Lacanians as having to do with actually enjoying stuff. Right. And I can uh, see that. In the usual sense. And of course, it was not meant that way. But And then the explanation of enjoyment or jouissance was perceived by the non-Lacanians as being patronizing and, oh, well, if you were in the inner circle, you would understand this. So it was just like adding insult. And then the Lacanians were like getting more and more defensive and scared. It's kind of like something I discuss in my, it's the same pattern I discuss at one point in my chapter of this Mm -hmm. vicious cycle of hurt and the attempt, the good, inten- the well-intentioned attempt to rectify the hurt 
ends up being a self-defense perceived by those who are hurt as re-traumatization because right. of lack of understanding, because they're not talking on the same registers, they're not talking from the same position to get into the more political dimension of it, the positionality of those who are saying, well, let's talk about it. Let's have a conversation about this. Let's get to know each other and we'll we'll fix it. That's the completely wrong register to respond to the kind of hurt based on inequality and inequity Mm -hmm. that is being articulated. And so then you end up in this kind of stalemate that's that's Mm -hmm. really, really dangerous. And I think regarding the relationship of theory to these political, socio-political situations, it's, I think it's a constant it's something that occupies my mind a lot. To what extent can these theories, like a Lacanian theory or obviously a Winnicottian theory, to what mm-hmm. extent can they be can they be moved from the individual level to these more cultural, sociopolitical levels without doing damage or right. reducing the sociopolitical realities to something that is coverable in the theory? And yep. it, it, it you gotta be really careful. So can I add just a, a, a little bit? Yeah, a little bit. I think that, I mean, this is, uh, it's interesting that you started with this question because it's uh, one of the things that really runs through my entire work. And it's because it's so important for me, for my readers to understand that for me, it's not an either or scenario. Right, uh, right. That focusing on ontological lack doesn't mean that I'm going to forget about racism or talking about racism doesn't mean that I'm going to forget about ontological lack, that it's completely Mm -hmm. possible to talk about them together. And in fact, it's productive to do so because I Mm -hmm. think in uh, sort of quote unquote real life situations, they actually interact in interesting ways. For instance, let's say something really horrible happens to you. You become ill or you have an accident or your lover leaves you or something terrible happens to you that makes you feel wounded. I think that in those situations, you are much more likely to become aware of your ontological, your existential lack and to start thinking about Mm -hmm. things. You start thinking about things like your mortality and your precariousness, kind of uh, ontological existential level of precariousness. So it's not even that in real life there has to be or is a division between these different levels. It's just that theoreticians have somehow managed to create this distinction. And I mean, I'm a Lacanian. But I do hold a lot of Lacanians responsible for not understanding a very simple, very simple (laughs) fact, namely that that there are other kinds of wounds that uh, people experience that come on top of the ontological wound or dig that wound deeper or however you want to think about it. And it's such a basic idea that I've always been kind of surprised at the resistance to that idea. It's almost like people think that if you start talking about socioeconomic inequality, then you can no longer talk about the Lacanian lacking being, which is just crazy. Of course, you can talk about all of it together. I think that that you're pointing to, both of you are are pointing to a fact that it does seem sometimes that hiding or covering that ontological lack, whether it be with self-help books or this notion of sort of, I'm not going to say that, you know, Kuba and I, we, we, we've done a lot of Deleuze and Guattari, so I'm not even on the theoretical level, but on a more personal everyday level, this notion of hiding the lack or making it up or masking it over. There's a way in which that can then lead to denying other forms of lack, right? So you need to have an awareness of both and be able to theoretically, because if you don't, then I think that it says a lot about, I mean, obviously we could talk about the way Zizek does or Lacan does about the way in which, you know, castration functions. And there's a, there's a way in which, you know, the masculine position tries to like make up for that, uh, that lack. But I do think it's even just simpler terms. There's a way in which hiding that or lying to yourself about that ontological lack, that, that initial trauma of entering into the symbolic order, et cetera, that that can then lead one to be unsympathetic towards others, you know, whether it be minorities or just specific other people who face hardships. And I think that this is one of the things, and this is a key, I think in in both of your works, you you sort of point out ways in which capitalism wants us to hide the ontological lack so that we're more easily able to uh, sort of only focus on maybe a lack for whether it be a, a new product or a new 
you know, or, or a new trend, et cetera, because then we're only trying to fill in with new objects, with new commodities, exactly. so to speak. Yeah, exactly. And I think I think what you're pointing out when you're talking about the urge to to hide the lack, skewer the lack, I, of course, makes me think about the notion of emptiness or unintegration in Winnicott. It's a, it's a way in which I think Lacan and Winnicott on parallel tracks I think they each knew from what I can tell from their from reading their work I think they each knew about each other but were really had kind of very different kinds of projects but overlapped had this kind of overlapping here and there but I think that the the frantic need the fear of emptiness the fear of lack in the Lacanian term makes the encounter with an with a person who demonstrates and articulates the specificity of their own wound or lack an extremely scary figure not just because as a white middle-aged white woman and a black person points out that middle-aged white women are the biggest problem of course i'm going to feel i'm going to feel particularly called out but it's more than that it's deeper than that and i think the understanding of the role of the ontological lack or the underlying emptiness is really enhances the understanding of why that's threatening and i think what winnicott brings to the table one of the things is pointing out the way in which the, the unintegration mm -hmm. is not just a loss and a lack it's also a foundation mm -hmm. and to you know the need to not obscure it is not just sort of a moral or political imperative of we must acknowledge this fact but it's also potentially a generative opening up of the self to wellsprings that i think mari's chapter in milner really uh mm -hmm. goes into in a lot of depth that we have these wellsprings that are based in unintegration, non-control, non-self, non-autonomy, all of these things that are construed in other contexts as negative. Since Gail brought up Milner, and I think this, an example of this kind of wellspring, now she has the one technique, which is like to sort of look, I want to say disassociation, but I don't know if that's, that's not exactly the right word, because I think there's like more of a negative connotation to that, but like the way mm. that she will sort of look out at something and kind of lose herself, lose her conscious self. But one image that was really stood out was this image of the sea that she discusses, which I immediately thought of a book, the last book in the sci-fi series, Dune. So Chapter House Dune has a character that has this sea child that she references. And I saw a connection and it's almost has to be that Frank Herbert read Milner's work. He was familiar with Freud and Jung and Adler and psychoanalysis in general. So what I'd like to do is perhaps just read this little passage just to set the, I guess, set the table for, okay. for Milner's discussion of the sea. And then I'm going to read a couple of passages from the book, and then we can kind of recapitulate there. However, as Milner recognizes accomplishing such a detachment from the other demands our willingness to surrender our egos from time to time, Milner describes her own experience of self-refashioning as one of sinking into her private sea into an amorphous, watery, oceanic space beneath the ego. For her, the ego mostly feels like a nuisance to be outwitted so as to create an opening for the sublime experience she's after. She thus spends a great deal of time trying to figure out how to elude or evade the ego so as to clear space for the kind of immediacy of experience or self-surrender that she regards as the precondition of created living. She frequently describes the alternative modalities of self-experience that she reaches when she sinks into her private sea as ones of being governed by the other or not me within herself. I read these terms as referring more to the real, to jouissance, than to the unconscious. This is because they carry a strong emphasis of bodily experience. Milner consistently relies on her body to guide her towards worldly transcendence. Simply put, the act of pushing her ego aside, however, temporarily allows her to access intense frequencies of bodily experience that are impossible whenever the ego's power remains intact. So these are really great passages just to really hammer home Milner's kind of approach here. And I want to contrast these with uh, some lines from Chapter House Dune. Odrade sat in her workroom, the usual morning clutter around her, and sensed sea child floating in the waves, washed by them, carried by them. The waves were the color of blood. Her sea child self anticipated bloody times. Next passage. 
lift and fall of waves, the sense of unbound visions with strange new places just beyond the curve limits of a watery world, that thrilling edge of danger implicit in the very substance that supported her, all of it combined to assure her she was sea child. Papa was calmer there, too, and Mama Sibia happier, face turned into the wind, dark dark hair blowing, a sense of balance radiated from those times, a reassuring message spoken in a language older than Odrade's, oldest other memory. This is my place, my medium. I am sea child. What was normal to someone who dwelt in water images even during these working moments, sea child could not forget Gamu, the smells, the breeze-blown substance of ocean weeds, the ozone that made it every breath oxygen rich and the splendid freedom and those around her so apparent in the way they walked and spoke conversation on the sea went deeper in a way than she had ever plumbed even small talk had its subterranean elements there an oceanic elocution that flowed with the currents beneath them odrade felt compelled to remember her own body afloat in that childhood sea she needed to recapture the forces she had known there take in the strengthening qualities she had learned in more innocent times that's pretty uncanny right yeah, that's really interesting. And uh, there's also that word oceanic, which is already in Freud. Just to contextualize things a bit for the listener, I mean, uh, the gist of my chapter, the book is on creativity, creative living as an antidote to what we're calling neoliberal self action, uh, no, uh, self, what, what are we calling it? Self optimization. So right. we, ha- we have this idea that our neoliberal society tries to make us sort of into these machines of efficiency and productivity and performance. And we are always supposed to perfect ourselves in various ways, improve ourselves. And um, Gay and I are looking for an antidote, antidote, kind of a remedy to this way of looking at human life. And we find it in psychoanalysis. And so the point of my chapter is to kind of look for that remedy through Milner, whereas Gail focuses on Winnicott with the same objective of finding a kind of antidote or remedy to the very instrumentalist way of living that neoliberalism imposes on us or teaches us to enact in our everyday lives. Mm -hmm. So in my chapter specifically, I begin with Lacan's notion of lack in being. I mean, Mm -hmm. there's that whole discussion of the two two different kinds of lacks, but then because I am fundamentally a Lacanian, I talk about Lacan's notion of lack and how creativity kind of leaps out of that lack in various ways. And I know that this is very different from what Deleuze and Guattari would say. I I think that that kind of two different ways of looking at creativity, there's the Lacanian model where creativity is rooted in lack. And then in Deleuze and Guattari, it would be like an overabundance or excess or like overflowing energy or something like that. That would be the cause of creativity. But in Lacanian terms, I'm looking at the, the relationship between nothingness Black on the one hand, and creative living or creativity on the other. And I uh, argue that, that, that there's a direct relationship in the sense that if you feel like you are lacking something, then you are more likely to kind of turn out toward the world and look for various ways of filling that lack. And mm-hmm. um, at one point, I say that there are basically two ways. You can either find something that pre-exists in the world that uh, seems to feel that lack, or you can create something yourself. And of course, when I talk about feeling your lack, I'm not saying that you can ever definitively feel it. I'm just saying that there are all these attempts to kind of temporarily give yourself a sense of meaningfulness or, you know, something that feels worthwhile in your life. So I, I'm starting from that kind of a Lacanian premise. And then I turn on to looking on to Milner, basically, I start looking at the ways in which uh, Milner theorizes the connection between self-loss, self-surrender, which is a slightly different way of thinking about it from Lacan, Lacan's like in being. She talks about it in terms of surrendering herself, losing herself, pushing aside her ego so as to access what she calls that private sea of hers. The idea is that it's when she's able to, to kind of descend into that private sea of hers, that she's able to experience the world in a creative manner and is even able to experience something that I call worldly transcendence, the kind of transcendence that happens in the kind of in the weave of everyday life instead of asking you to exit everyday life. It's something that happens in the kind of ebb and flow of living. And I link that 
privacy of hers to what she calls the not me, the not me, the other within myself. For her, this this other or not me within herself is very much linked to embodiment, as Mm -hmm. Kutu said. Um, So I'm drawing a parallel between her notion of embodiment and Lacan's notion of jouissance. And Mm -hmm. in in that context, you bring in Freud's notion of the oceanic, because these things are loosely connected. So the idea is that it's only if you allow yourself to experience a certain kind of self-loss or self-surrender, surrender of the ego, that you're able to access these other realms of being that have to do with her understanding of creative living or creativity. So yeah, the private sea for her is a recurring metaphor. She even talks about descending into the mud of the sea in search of what she calls the beads, beads like pearls, where she's looking at like tiny little moments in her everyday life. And this is really important to emphasize when you talk about Milner. She's really talking about everyday life, about mundane experiences. And she's looking at the things like tiny little things that pique her interest or make her happy at a particular moment. And um, at the end, like a lot of her books are based on her journal entries. She kept a journal and uh, at the end of the day, she would kind of, quote unquote, collect her beads, haul them in like a fisherman and kind of examine you know, what that particular day made her most happy, Mm. what gave her something, what gave her like a glimmer of sublimity, a glimmer of transcendence without her having to leave the world behind in any way. So she was always looking for that kind of a point or moment or experience that gave her something, a little taste of the extraordinary within the folds of the ordinary. And Basically, she comes to argue that it's in that private sea of her, in the in the mud of the ocean, that she's able to find that in the oceanic, in the not me, the other within herself, in jouissance, basically, if you translate it into Lacanian terms. Mm-hmm. So anything that carried a little bit of jouissance, a kind of a sliver of jouissance or a little morsel of jouissance was something that drew her attention and captured her. And that was her way of making her life, her everyday life feel worthwhile, meaningful, full of abundance in ways that I really admire because it has to do with really minute experiences uh, rather than, you know, grandiose gestures. It's really interesting that I think the thematically this kind of works really well for this comparison, the lines that I was reading from the, the Dune book in the sense that one of the big conceits of the Dune series is that there are no thinking machines. Those have been sort of outlawed. But the people become very, the this character, this Odraid character, is part of this, uh, they're sort of modeled on the Jesuit order. And so their self-discipline is, and you know, many of the characters that you see in the books are these like extremely like the upper echelons of self-discipline down to like they can control the, the pH balance of their body. So they are <laughs> uber instrumentalized. So it's interesting that he is kind of, incorporating this more like i don't know if it's more of like an embodied passion than this kind of a cold logic this sort of very cold pragmatic logic that you see in this sort of group the benny jesuit so i don't know i think that was an interesting kind of thematic connection to draw yeah so i guess just very briefly i did want to just add to what i said uh, or kind of reinforce the fact that this book is really the gist of the book is to look at alternative ways of living to the way in which neoliberal society teaches us to live, which is this kind of a very instrumentalist, performance-oriented, productivity-oriented, almost economic model of how we're supposed to live our lives. We're always supposed to perfect ourselves, improve our performance in every possible way, improve ourselves through self-help or whatever. And so basically, uh, both Gail and I yeah. <laughs> we decided that psychoanalysis was the lens through which we could find alternatives to this way of living because we both intuitively feel like it's not really working for a lot of people, that there are a lot of people out there who are very dissatisfied with their lives and feel like, feel like, for instance, that they are, they are constantly running out of time because there are so many demands coming at, at them that they can't possibly fulfill everything that they they can't do everything that they're supposed to do that everything is moving too fast there are too many requirements too many pressures too much stress people want to slow down and so at the core of the book is the attempt to kind of conceptualize another way of life that would be something different from this instrumentalist self-optimizing way that we are so accustomed to that we don't 
necessarily even notice that that's how we're living. But I think that a lot of people are feeling the dissatisfaction of that way of life and are looking for alternatives. And that's what we're trying to provide in the book. One of the things, and I probably didn't articulate this well in my question, which you don't have to turn to, Coop, because I remember it off the top of my head. But when I was reading through and trying to link together your two chapters, I was thinking about how Milner's practice of worldly transcendence, or what is it, wide perception, I believe is the term, that it reminded me a little bit of, and again, this is probably poorly articulated, but in my head, I was thinking about how this shedding of the ego or sidestepping it, as you put it, reminded me a little bit of Winnicott's discussion of transitional phenomena where outside and inside become a little bit blurred, subject object become less distinct. Now, I know that he's speaking about infantile experience, but I do think that perhaps, Gail, you may want to say something about whether or not that's at least analogous. I know I'm not using yeah. the terms very correctly, but I, I just, in my head, it, there was some sort of interesting connection there. Yeah, I, I think there's a, a very interesting connection. I think I think that's a, a really important insight, a connection that we might not make as explicitly as we could have, but we might now, thank you for the tip, uh, <laughs> in our conclusion that still has to be written. There you go. Um, there we go. So I think what I would say is in common between the two notions mm -hmm. is the blurring or playing with boundaries, right. between, like you said, between internal and external, between self and other. I think that's a really important move that both of them are making, mm -hmm. that it's not just me on the inside and you on the outside. But as Mari said, you know, there's a not me that dwells inside me for Milner. And for Winnicott, it would be, I think the not me, well, no, the, the not me dwells inside me as what he calls a self object. For I mean, like developmentally speaking, that's the case for a while. And then that changes through various mechanisms having to do with the process of destruction that we could talk about if we want to. But but it's not just a developmental issue. I mean, yeah, he, the transitional object, the intermediate area are developmental experiences. But he emphasizes over and over again that the experience of playing with boundaries is something that is part of human experience. It needs to be part of a human experience. In fact, if Winnicott were a social theorist, I think he would say, along with what we're trying to do, that that, that kind of playfulness and playing with boundaries between otherwise opposite things is what is necessary to counter the excessive binarism and dichotomous thinking of a capitalistic neoliberal society that has everything pitted against each other. Everything is zero sum. We can't have immigration because if people come from other places, if they gain in our society, we will necessarily lose. If you get into college, then I won't. Mm -hmm. It's very zero sum. And I think that, and it's also very transactional. Yes. I'll do for you if you'll do for me. And a Winnicottian alternative to that is I can't be me without you. Right. And I can't become me without experimenting with where I begin and you end and where you begin and I end. And that that's the very nature of who we are as selves is to be constantly walking that line, dipping a foot into me-ness and you-ness back again and, and over and over again. There's not, I think where, where I might I haven't read enough Milner to be able to go into this really definitively, but I think, so I'm not going to put it in terms of Milner or <laughs> That's Dune. That's fine. I'm really struck by your passage from Dune, Cooper. I, I think I really see the connection to the Milner and also to Winnicott. If the water self, if the watery self, if the dissolved self is an sort of an absolute alternative to a land self, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, to, to a uh, put together, a pulled together, bounded self, then that would not be particularly Winnicottian because the self, for him, the true self, the core self is not an absolute, it can't exist without its 
quote unquote opposite right the false self. this false self both is what it can fall into it's a danger that it can fall into which is the way we usually think of the phony inauthentic self mm-hmm. but it's also in a way that process of navigating boundaries includes me sometimes being quote unquote false insofar as i'm speaking the language of another that doesn't have to be compliance as winnicott would say it it doesn't okay. have to be me just giving my whole self over mm-hmm. to an alien to a demand that I conform to something that's not me. It might be my way of being curious about another person. Right. Uh, speaking their language. I, I really like how the notion of language is included in that Dune mm-hmm. passage. The idea that we can dissolve our language in this watery environment and even small talk can become something that's generative. Yes. It doesn't have to be, I mean, now I'm translating it, so to speak, into right. it doesn't have to be fake to take that step into the social world or the world that's not my my real, authentic, deep self. It can also be also be something that establishes relationship without which I, in turn, cannot exist as my as my creative creative self. It's also um this kind of back and forth between the, I I love the way you phrase this dissolved self and the land self. And in Milner, you get very much the uh, image of her going back and forth between these two kind of realms of being. And of course, when she's in her quote unquote land self, the dissolved self or the sea self is a part of her and vice versa. But one of the things I wanted to call attention to is something that interests me personally about this Mm -hmm. kind of um, diving into the sea sea self or what she calls in other, uh, some of her other books, she calls wide perception, a a specific way of perceiving the world where the object actually becomes a part of the object, the object that you you are looking at becomes a, a part of you in a way because you relax the boundaries you're, of your ego and you allow the other to kind of come toward you in a way that almost results in this kind of emerging of self and other. But one of the really interesting things to think about in this context is the is the danger that (laughs) pertains to that act of allowing oneself to dissolve. You know, for for Milner and I have to say for myself also creativity, the act of creating of in my case writing, and I'm assuming assuming in her case writing and also painting. I think one one reason I Milner's work resonates so strongly with me is that I identify with her understanding of creativity, which has to do precisely with this uh, notion of allowing the self the self to dissolve so that something about the the jouissance of the real emerges. And you lose yourself in the work completely. What intrigues me about this process is the danger that always accompanies this act of allowing yourself to dissolve, allowing yourself to dive into the sea, to the private sea, into jouissance. Because Mm -hmm. when you allow yourself to be engulfed by jouissance in some ways, you're always walking very close to self-destruction. And it can be very scary when you don't know uh, whether you will be able to come back to the land self, Mm -hmm. uh, whether you can kind of reemerge from that dissolved state and become a functioning self again. And I I think for me personally, that has always been uh, the challenge of creativity. Like how far can I let myself go uh, so that I know that I can still come back to the world of the symbolic order, like how mm-hmm. far, yeah. how far into the industry sounds can I allow myself to descend? And I think one, one, one very kind of personal reason that I keep thinking about this is that I grew up with a, a schizophrenic uncle who lived in our household. Okay, and uh, so. My entire youth, my parents were really worried that I would become schizophrenic because I sh- I shared a lot of characteristics with my uncle. I was a bookworm, a nerd. You know, they were worried that that would lead because he had been he had been very academically oriented, even though the household was way too poor to support any kind of aspirations like that. But he was very intellectual, and so the threat of schizophrenia was always hanging over my head 
into my 20s. And so, and I had a tremendous writer's block in my late 20s when I was trying to finish my dissertation and in my early 30s. And when I broke it, it had to do with this ability ability to completely just kind of dive into the do into the jouissance of the real and allow myself to dissolve as as a landed landed creature mm-hmm. if you will. but initially at the beginning it was very very scary because I was afraid that I couldn't find my my way back somehow I have sort of learned how to navigate that that kind of back and forth between the two modalities of being and the understanding that one is always like both are present simultaneously within one's being that you know one may be prominent at one moment and then the other becomes prominent at other moments uh, but that takes some getting used to. And I think that not everyone is actually capable of diving into their private sea because it's too scary. It's uh, yes. too dangerous. Reminds yes. me of distri- the sort of warning that Deleuze and Guattari give in A Thousand mm. Plateaus of don't destratify too quickly. <laughs> too, you can, too there's quickly. this line of flight. There's this line of death. You can. Exactly. That's right. I want to go back to Gail because I thought. Something you said, and I want to even, I can maybe even skip down to, I wanted to read your passage from the text because I'm sort of a fan of the bastard son of um, of uh, German idealism, Max Stirner. And um, I think his no- notion of the creative nothing is very relevant, and especially in this kind of like context of the ontological lack. But I think the way that he, or at least this is kind of a misnomer, but we'll call it ego communism, for example, is about this relationship to the other and recognizing that, you know, it's kind of like I am you and what I see is me sort of vibe to it. But let me go ahead and read this because I thought this was really good. Just to contextualize, this is this is Novalis providing a corrective to Fichte. Here I am enhanced or rather I come into being as a self-conscious entity by the encounter, not with a self-produced theoretical limit, but with another self whom I love. That self reflects me, yes, but also adds something of its own singularity to the subjective mix. Novalis's shift from the not I to you in his conceptualization of the feature that is necessary for the I's formation finds its psychoanalytic equivalent in Winnicott's shift from the integral objects of the Kleinian model to actual others surrounding the infant in his theory of ego development. I can't tell you how pleased I am that you pulled out (laughs) something having to do with Novalis. Um, Yay! I'm intrigued now. I've I've seen the name, but I'm... Totally yeah, Novalis was sort of my my first own discovery. Okay. In, in I guess German literature, you know, I had I had compliantly read everything that was was given to me very quickly. You know, because of the compressed time, as I described, I was a musician first, and then had a compressed time as an undergraduate. And then I I can't remember to be honest how I how I discovered Novalis initially, but I was intrigued without understanding. And then I I went to Vienna on a Fulbright to do dissertation research. And I was thinking to myself, well, you know, Novalis died when he was 29. So there can't be that much. I like my instinct uh, with literature or anything else is is often, I like shorter texts. I like to go deep. So, you know, not, not the sort of long, you know, War and Peace, Thomas Mann, you know, that kind of thing, but more of these intensive short stories and stuff like that. And I already had that. And Novalis writes in fragments. He has a novel, but he, an unfinished novel, but he has a lot of fragments. So I was really attracted to that. And I thought, well, there can't be that much of it. It turns out that he had three volumes of about 800 pages a piece full of fragments. I spent a year in an extremely old, unheated, well, it was a heated apartment, but I had to carry oil from the local gas station up three flights of stairs and fill an oil heater in the middle of the living room that was the only heat for the apartment. So that's my association with this sort of ascetic immersion into the fragments of Novalis. And I'm super excited that you're you're pulling this out because I think that for someone who wrote in, you know, basically 1795 to 1801, Novalis was so radical in his thinking, both in backwards, so to speak, in relation to the Kantians and especially Fichte, whom he was responding to, and also forwards toward our own time. What you're describing is the, I think, the main move that he's making, which is to substitute the the solipsistic 
orientation of a Fichte who said, who took Kant one step further, Kant who had said, you know, we can't know the thing in itself directly, everything is filtered through Mm -hmm. categories in our own, I, our, our, our own subject, subjectivity. And he's like, okay, what's important is this kind of I-ness that is constantly emanating. And he didn't quite go this far, but his followers did to say it basically creating the world. But the only way we can do this is if there's a limit to the the sort of constantly emanating I-ness in the form of a not I. And that, you know, I mean, this is a, a well-known concept that we get to, I mean, even just on basic psychological levels, I get to know who I am by seeing myself in another's eyes. It's like the other in his model is just a theoretical not I, and that you can imagine the political implications of this. It's a, it's a, it's part of the, whether people know it or not, who are being imperialists and colonialists. It's it's a really great justification for, you mm-hmm. know, let me get to know myself by taking a safari and getting to know the people in the other play or, you know, whatever it is. It, it just runs through Western tradition, this, I'm getting, mm-hmm. this idea of getting to know me by getting, by falsely getting to know somebody who's not a you in their own right. Right. As would have it, but is simply a not I, just somewhat mm. different. And mm-hmm. exotic. And so I think what Novala says is that we, the way we get to know ourselves or come to self conscious identity or uh, status is by engaging with you lovingly, like a you whom I can love. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and I think that that's, I think that that's a really important point. And the other move that he made that's related to this is another one of my quotes. Where he of, of Novalis. By the way, what you read was not by Novalis. That was my my reading of Novalis. And it, the other quote has to do with the idea, very philosophical, but it has ramifications. That what is real is the hovering between subject and object. Mm, mm-hmm, In effect, mm-hmm. the hovering creates subject and object. Mm-hmm. Translated into real life, thinking of relationships, I don't have an immutable essential self that then communicates with or relates to you and ditto for you instead we are cre- each of us is created in the relationship which itself i mean hovering is a great image i think because it's so vibrant it's mm-hmm. so dynamic it's not mm-hmm. like the bridge between the two of us or the right. or something static it's a constantly moving phenomenon I think that's that's really great. Go ahead, Coop. Sorry. I was just going to say, I very much like that. I've always kind of described for Sterner, it's like this, it's not about the discourse, it's about the intercourse and not necessarily to connote the sexual aspect of that, but okay. the I think the intimacy, the openness right. to not exactly merging with the other, but like, I don't know, some, somehow integrating. I can't exactly. Yeah, inter- inter- yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. But I didn't have anything further. Go ahead, Taylor. Well, first of all, in my head, I keep thinking how the discourse, not just of Winnicott and Milner, but now Novalis, solipsism has pretty much been refuted in each of these little uh, little discourses. But I could see uh, your description, Gail, of Novalis and uh, this hovering being very much at home in Marie's sort of narrative about Milner's work. And, and so all of this is sort of tying together and it's it's really great to, to see in real time. One of the things that I thought was fascinating because Marie, you brought it out and I was going to talk about this where this notion of dissolving the self and Coop brought it out, right? Don't de-stratify too quickly can be overwhelming, can be frightening for many people, whether we think about it in the terms of schizophrenia as process or your own anecdotal, your own lived experience of your schizophrenic uncle and that fear of it being sort of over your head, don't dissolve because then you might collapse. I can imagine. One of the things that I found fascinating was you you put it, uh, I'm not sure if you're paraphrasing Milner or putting it in your own words, but you kind of say this process of why perception involves someone involves a letting go of a kind of mastery and when you use that word i immediately thought of beyond the pleasure principle when freud asked himself these men coming back from war with their trauma they're having these traumatic dreams these anxiety dreams 
how can their dreams of reliving these these wartime scenes accord with my fundamental hypothesis that dreams at their kernel are wish fulfillment. And so he puts forward this idea that it's this desire to accumulate or to muster the anxiety that we didn't have before the traumatic event. And so it's about this drive towards mastery. Now, I don't necessarily have a full question in this, but I think that that's, it kind of shows perhaps Freud's Rightly or wrongly, because I know Anna Freud took this to an extreme and Lacan has this whole spiel against, you know, ego psychoanalysis where it's it's just about strengthening the ego. But it does seem that this part of Freud in the, what, 1920, it seems to be this idea about strengthening the ego as mastering this phenomenon that that sort of came out of nowhere. And I'm wondering about perhaps Freud, I'm not saying perhaps Freud is wrong here, but I do think that your description of letting go and of sort of giving up mastery in order to gain creativity. I'm wondering about that relationship, if there is any. That's just off the top of my head. And I had it in the, in the questions, but I, I don't know. I don't have a good question to lead with, but I, I just want your reaction, I suppose. That's actually very evocative, what you said. I think that the process of giving up mastery in mm-hmm. order to gain access to a certain frequency of creativity can only happen if you have a a certain degree of ego strength to begin with. This is a very un-Lacanian thing to say, and I apologize to my fellow Lacanians. I am by no means an advocate of ego psychology, but I feel that that the dangerous aspects of the notion of self-disillusion or becoming a see self or kind of falling into jouissance. Those dangerous aspects of that process can only be undertaken if you have some ego strength to begin with. If you have no ego at all, it's impossible to undertake that process because you have nothing to come back to in a way. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I mean, again, speaking personally, one way in which I got over my writer's block was actually I've done two different analyses in my life. One was a kind of a relational analysis and the second one was a Lacanian analysis. As a preface, what I'm going to say by saying that I would have never survived the Lacanian analysis if I had not had first the relational analysis. Interesting. Because I needed something to strengthen my ego for various kind of idiosyncratic personal reasons that I won't go into. I really had no ego to begin with in my 20s and even early 30s when I entered analysis. What prevented me from diving into the jouissance of the real in order to write, in order to be create creative, was precisely that I was too afraid because I did not have any ego strength at all. And then the first analysis, which was relational, gradually built up enough ego strength for me to mm-hmm. be able to risk momentarily losing that ego, pushing it aside, because I had some strength so that I knew that I could always kind of pull myself back to the realm of the symbolic order. And more broadly speaking, I think that there are a lot of people in this world who really have been stripped of their egos completely. For those kinds of people, the Lacanian analytic approach really doesn't work because it's just too harsh. The second analysis, the Lacanian analysis, was all about me coming to terms with the fact that the analyst didn't have any answers and it was all up to me to figure it out and authority meant nothing and all that stuff. I could have never ever survived that if I had not first build up some ego strength. So, right. and this is actually kind of a political issue that I think people don't often talk about because it's uncomfortable. It's easy to criticize the ego. You don't even have to be a Lacanian to do so. Milner does so. It's certainly not just Lacanians who are dislike the ego. But then um, when you start thinking about all the ways in which you can be dispossessed of your ego strength in this world, how you can be stripped bare, as it were, of everything ego related, then it actually becomes kind of a political issue because some of the ways in which people are dispossessed of their egos have to do with structural inequalities. Sometimes they have to do with more kind of idiosyncratic familial matters, yep. as was the case with me. I guess 
both actually because poverty poverty mm-hmm. is also in the picture but but it can be either something idiosyncratic familial that happens to you but it can also be something like racism that mm-hmm. strips you of your ego and then in that in that context going in and saying get rid of your ego <laughs> doesn't really make a lot of sense i couldn't agree more with mari i think it's i think it's it's a very politically charged issue it's sometimes a gendered issue, yes. but not always. Certainly Milner, Milner is a woman, was a woman, and mm-hmm. and she was advocating a similar kind of thing. But I'm reminded here of Nancy Chodorow's important correction and Carol Gilligan's in the 70s to notions of development. Gilligan's notion or, or correction to the idea that development is always moving toward more and more autonomy. Mm-hmm. And so the more autonomous or independent one is, the more advanced one is either as an individual or as a society and pointing out that that is very gendered and that there, there are different notions of maturity that might have more to do with relationality, that kind of thing. But also I wanted to point out really quickly that this links up very much with Winnicott in the sense that he says, and sort of an equivalent in Winnicott to the constitutional constitutive lack in Lacan, I would say, is Winnicott's idea that he's focusing on a time in development, but also a situation, ontologically speaking, in which there is no self or ego in the usual sense. Mm-hmm. It's pre pre edipal it's not dyadic, you know, baby and mother. It's mm-hmm. it's not ego and other. It's, it's certainly not ego, other, and the thing you're competing against for. But it's it's pre that, and so it it in that context too. I mean, Mari said it herself, but for me personally, having to do with issues related to that, one of the reasons I'm attracted to to Winnicott is because he focuses on this notion of sheer being, of sheer. Mm-hmm coming into being, going on being, being and what's at stake. That's why it's hard for me to embrace as my creative process, letting go and just giving up all boundaries because it's a, you know, it's a dangerous place. And so I think working with Mari has helped me look back over my career in life and think that, you know, I'm looking for other alternatives to either having or not having boundaries. I mean, I think this is I think this is the right way to see it. And in terms of all this discussion of the sea, I'm wondering, you know, strengthening the ego or dissolving it, maybe one of the metaphors we could bring in is something like an anchor, right? Because mm-hmm. Marie, you, you were talking about you need something to come back to in the first place in order to dissolve. And so an anchor, I think, is kind of a, a nice image of of perhaps being able to then dive in and come back. I guess then you helped, this discussion helped to reframe the question about about Freud, because I do think you make a good point that strengthening the ego doesn't have to be all bad. I think that you don't have to necessarily apologize to the Lacanians, because I think that what Lacan saw Freud's work turning into was mainly about strengthening the ego. Mm -hmm. And and, And if that's the only thing that analysis is doing, then I think we are led astray because, you know, not just as Gail said with Winnicott and these different transitional phenomena and these different, the shared being and these other things, but obviously there is something to Milner's point about dissolving the ego that can stand in the way of, there's dangers to it, but I think that that's no risk, no reward, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, I mean, I love the image of the anchor. I often think about it very concretely as being kind of tethered or being linked to the signifier mm-hmm. yeah, so, yeah. so that I can use the signifier to, to kind of pull me out of the jouissance when I really right. need, need it. And uh, a creative process in some ways is about combining signifiers with jouissance to begin with. Mm-hmm. But then there's this, this idea that the signifier is an anchor that leads you back to the symbolic order and mm-hmm. kind of keeps, keeps you safe. But uh, no risk, no reward. I saw that you had this question about worldly transcendence and Lacan's notion of sublime, sublimation. And yeah, this is, I think, directly linked to that. So I already talked about Milner and worldly trends. Right. The idea that she was looking for these kind of little tidbits of sublimity in her mundane existence, in her everyday mm-hmm. life. And that's actually how Lacan defines sublimation. He defines sublimation as 
quote, raising a mundane object to the dignity of the thing, mm -hmm. uh, end of quote. So the thing with the capital T, Gail mentioned Kant and th the thing in itself, and Lacan has the same idea that you cannot have access to the thing in itself. Right. But you can have access to little perks of it, little um, morsels or echoes or tidbits or whatever you want to call them. And this is the part of Lacan that I most love and that has most influenced my approach to Lacan. In Seminar 7, he has a few examples of sublimation. And I'll just mm -hmm. mention the one that I mentioned in the chapter itself, which is when he talks about the way in which Cezanne, the painter, paints apples. And he says, you know, an apple painted by Cezanne is never just an apple. There's always a kind of a sliver of sublimity in the apple that is painted by Cezanne specifically. Specifically, that there was some that Suzanne had this skill for capturing something about the the thing, something, some little echo of the thing. That it was not just you know a literal reproduction of an apple, but it was the apple plus then something else, and that something else was linked to sublimity for him. And uh, this was exactly Milner's method of worldly transcendence uh, in the sense that she was always looking for that little spark of the sublime in mundane objects. She was constantly raising mundane objects to the dignity of the thing, the ultimate sublime object being the thing with the capital T. Mm -hmm. That's a short explanation of the similarities between the two thinkers. Yeah, and it's fascinating how different Lacan's notion of sublimation is from Freud's, which I don't even have to get into, but there are so many of these terms that Lacan will retain, but radically, you know, distinguish, if you will, by maybe he'll want to say he's like remaining faithful to the kernel of Freud's thinking, but also shedding some of the, uh, some of the, I don't want to say ideological weight, but you know, you can think of even like terms like the phallus or castration, they're completely, you know, uh, untethered from uh, the organ. And uh, that's, that's just, that's not a question, but I did want to ask, this involves both of you. You said something interesting in that I hadn't even thought about it, about this notion of auto-theoretical work coming back into vogue or coming into vogue, which I guess I, had, I just hadn't thought about it or read about it. But I wanted to know, first of all, and this you can cast this question aside because it's not important, if that auto-theoretical turn, which is mixing sort of a theoretical lens and an autobiographical lens, if that coincides a little bit with the rise in theory fiction, and if that has anything to do with it, but also just maybe both of you can talk a little bit about the decision to co-author on both ends your own auto-theoretical perspectives. It's true that, uh, well, particularly after Maggie Nelson's 2015, The Argonauts, are okay. you familiar with that text? No. It, it kind of blew the critical theoretical world off its rails in a way because okay. it was something fresh and new. In that text, she'd actually written some other previous texts that were already in that genre a bit, but there was something about this text, The Argonauts, that really spoke to theory heads, to theoretical mm -hmm. people. In that text, she uses a combination of high theory you know, a lot of Roland Barthes and some Lacan, definitely mm -hmm. Freud and other, uh, Nietzsche and other people in the mix. She uses a combination of that kind of high theory with an autobiographical premise. So she talks about her own relationship with her lover and about all kinds of per very personal things. So there's a, this kind of a mixing of the very highly theoretical and very deeply autobiographical. Mm -hmm. And people just love this book and Grey Wolf Press probably made a lot of money off it. because <laughs> I don't think they expected it to become such a huge hit, but everyone was suddenly assigning it in their courses. As a result of this, uh, there was this renewed interest. Also, at the same time, Paul Preci Preciado, Testo Junkie, there he actually uses the term auto theory. So he's okay. the one who coined it in a way. And so those two texts together kind of created this whole new movement, a whole new way of theorizing that is about combining theory and autobiography or personal anecdotes as, at least. And then people started looking back toward 
history and like looking at, at where we could find people who had already done this type of writing earlier. And one of the main reference points is the later Roland Barthes, when you think of something like A Lover's Discourse mm -hmm. or Barthes by Barthes, his autobiography, very much this mishmash of theory and autobiography, uh, very mm -hmm. fascinating. So he's one of those nodes, uh, historical kind of reference points. Uh, but then people started looking at other possible reference points and uh, one segment of theory that kind of, over, uh, kind of came back into prominence was Black feminist theory from the 1980s that had been kind of pressed aside by post-structuralist feminism in the 90s. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You think of people like Audre Lord and Angela Davis uh, mm -hmm. who, who wrote in a personal voice. So those became kind of pre predecessors to contemporary order theory. And I'm not sure if people are aware of the fact that there might be a connection to why a lot of people are suddenly reading Milner. It might be just my imagination that a lot of people are suddenly reading her, but it feels to me that they are. I suddenly have colleagues, you know, mentioned in an email offhand that I'm writing a, a chapter on Milner and suddenly I get a response back saying, oh my God, I've just discovered her. She's so great. I'm reading all her books. A lot of people seem to be interested in her. And That's great. Uh, yeah. And so I think that there is some sort of a link, although I'm not I'm not sure that I, I would draw a, a direct correlation and say that it's because of auto theory that people are now reading Milner, but there must be some sort of a connection between the two. Yeah. Like Baudrillard's America would be another touchstone. Yeah. Point. Yeah, absolutely. Freud's self-analysis, but he didn't do a lot of that, just a little, but all of the authors you named, I, and definitely will have to put on my list, my ever-increasing list, as we all have, right? The, the never-ending <laughs> list of things to read. <clears throat> But I, I believe now off the top of my head, I've heard some discussion, but I haven't gotten to read the Argonauts yet. So I, I will put that on my list. But for you, Gail, I mean, how do you feel about this mode of writing? Have you done this before? Is this something new? And what do you, what do you think about this way of exposition? It could not be more new for me <laughs> <clears throat> in every way. I had traditionally been so... You know, again, this is all retrospective. <clears throat> I wasn't necessarily aware of the whys and wherefores at the time, but mm -hmm. retrospectively, I had been so skeptical of bringing self into writing mm -hmm. that I, in my teaching, tended to avoid first person narrative. Right. I found myself annoyed by. First person narrative never did, never worked with autobiography or memoir. Mm -hmm. Retrospectively and analytically, I would say that it has to do with stuff that I have learned about myself over the years with the help of Winnicott and Anna Analysis and mm -hmm. my students and my colleagues, having to do with the, the skepticism about exposing the self. Yes. Because of the susceptibility then of the self to either being exposed to, you know, like spotlight. No, 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 not let's not do that. That's uh, dangerous. But also in Winnicottian terms, the, you know, if the self is exposed, then it is immediately in danger of being co-opted by others. Interesting. Placed by others, right? The idea of compliance. And that, that has right. a lot to do with my own life, as you can imagine. So therefore, the notion that it's not about me, it's never about me, can't be about me, was a mantra, has been a mantra for me as a teacher and a scholar you know, I don't think that's been all bad. I, you know, I like the, the same way that I like to work with short texts. I also prefer to publish articles to books and I've published some stuff that's, I know it's about me, but nobody <laughs> could possibly know it's about me. Right. It's right. about that. It takes place in the intermediate area. It's about the texts. Right. Right. And I think that that also helps with my teaching because I think in teaching all too often as in life, but teaching is my metier or education, students already have a tendency to regard us as projection screens and to need, you know, to look at us as people. And if we unwittingly or wittingly take advantage of that and make ourselves into this larger than life figure in their life, right. that's unethical. Yes. <laughs> in my opinion, as as yeah. teaching. So 
holding myself back, being personal insofar as it can facilitate them, but no farther has always been my mode of engagement. My students started bringing to me Maggie Nelson, for example. I had one particular student who was just the world's biggest fan of Maggie Nelson. Mm -hmm. I started reading this. For me, the turning point, in addition to Mari's books, her crossover books. So I'd read The Singularity of Being, for example, her academic books, but then I read The Call of Character, which is the sort of crossover book that is auto-theoretical. So that was a start. But also more recently, as comes out in my chapter, reading Ocean Vong was my conversion moment Mm -hmm. to first-person narrative because of the way in which his novel, On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous, does something more complex than just sort of a simplistic self-revelation that I was comfortable with. And so in the context of both having encountered more and more auto theory and really enjoying it, auto theory, and also some literary work that is auto fiction, not Mm -hmm. memoir exactly, not autobiographical, but auto fiction. Okay. That sort of primed, primed the ground for me to want to, try it out with Mari and Mari, you know, my initial thought was we would write about these others, but it was Mari who said, Hey, why don't we try one of these crossover books? And yeah. super scary as Mari, <laughs> super, very different, very, very different, not to have a literary text to hold on to, to analyze. Oh, yeah. Wow. yeah. I mean, that's just so new for me. I'm a, I'm a literaturwissenschaftlerin, right? I'm a literary <laughs> Yes, yes. I'm not a I'm not a theoretician and I'm not, you know, it's just a different relationship to theory, to mm-hmm. myself, to writing. I write articles, I don't write books, I write about literature, I don't write theory, but the process of working together with Mari has has been head exploding and transformative <laughs> for me. <laughs> and so I it's been really great because my writing and my engagement with with my students and with material has even in my academic work, I think has has changed. So now I'm I'm a fan of well done auto theory. <laughs> yeah, I mean it definitely has to be well done. I can imagine this being botched and that not interesting anyone. But it is interesting that your ego dissolution was actually putting your ego out there right for mm-hmm. others, and so yeah. that's there's an irony there. Now we have had you for two hours and oh plus God. because I don't want to necessarily keep you too much longer, but I wanted to give maybe one question from me and one from Coop and then we could wrap up. Is that, is that okay if we keep you for another 15, 20 minutes? Absolutely. And I, can I also say something about Please. the uh, auto theoretical um, thing? So I think Maggie Nelson might have quoted this. I know that mm-hmm. this quote is somehow in my head. It's from Eileen Miles, the poet. She says something like the dirty secret is that it has always been about me. Uh-huh. There, that's <laughs> great. And um, I think that I think the personal autographical kind of little bits or threads uh, started seeping into my work very early on, mm-hmm. even, even though I was writing these, uh, you know, purely theoretical academic books, there was always a little bit of autobiography mixed in it because yeah. I had to I had to justify the fact that I was saying things that I knew would anger would anger some of my colleagues, uh, <laughs> particularly Lacanian. So when I when I started emphasizing, for instance, the context specific lack, the importance of paying attention to that, I felt like I had to somehow justify that. So right. I started revealing the fact that I grew up really poor. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was the first thing that came out, and then so it gradually. Uh, I mean, I was trained at the height of uh, post-structuralism in the 90s when it was absolutely forbidden to speak in, about yourself. But by the time I was writing my dissertation, I felt like I had to just like try to protect myself from uh, oncoming criticism by saying, you know, I'm interested in this X thing because I have experienced this. Like, please understand the, the link. And I always felt that all everything that I said, theoretically speaking, had something to do with myself. And I think that that's right. a lot of theoreticians and they don't just they don't say that, but that's often the case. And then it kind of just snowballed for me until 2018 when I published Penis Envy and uh, Other mm-hmm. Bad Feelings. And that's a, that's a very strongly autobiographical, um, it's an auto-theoretical book. And uh, just uh, to 
cap off this, I think that there's absolutely a link to the, the rise of theory fiction, as you phrased it. I think that it's not a coincidence that there has also been this kind of a emergence of this theory fiction modality of writing. I love the poetic quote because I think everyone, you know, I know that Cooper and I are, are, we could call it para academic. We're parasitic academics. We sort of, you know, hang around the edges, but you know, whenever you, for me, it was translating. That was my passion. And that was because I wanted to, to read these books. And then it became about sharing, right? If, cause I always thought if no one else is going to do it, I have to, I think that a lot of academics if they were honest with themselves, yeah, I mean, they are writing about things they're passionate about. Hopefully, I mean, I can imagine a literary scientist, as Gail put it, that's completely dispassionate and objective. I can imagine that, but that would, to me, seem to be the exception rather than the rule. Or their passion is somehow displaced from the object they're interpreting, etc. So they're still bound up in there somehow. Well, you you know yeah. how I feel about neutrality and objectivity from reading yes. After <laughs> and yes. um, using the German term like that is very much for me a, I would say primarily first and foremost, it's a harking back to when that kind of scientific approach was required of me, not just German studies, but a German <laughs> doctor father. That's the style. You, you lay out the literature, then you position yourself mm -hmm. against it kind of like a remembering what my actual work as it ended up being was always trying to counter mm -hmm. at the same time as I think that there is value in regarding the text or the idea that you're engaging with as having a reality of its own and being curious about it in its own right, so to speak. That's the legitimate scientific, you know, it's, it, it's data but it's living data that you can engage with in relationship. Right. But <clears throat> yeah, it is so, always, so. always about ourselves. <laughs> and if we're just, if we're just honest about that, I think that there's something to it. And just off the top of my head, you know, Marie, you and I were talking last night, just sending little emails, almost as text messages. And uh, I do think Lacanians should not be so hard on you for bringing up context specific lack because of, the fact that, you know, in seminar four, as I kind of mentioned, which I won't go into, but Lacan lays out three different kinds of lack, each relating differently to the real symbolic and imaginary. And so you would, um, you would think then that they would be comfortable with talking about th those issues. I had to look up, I went and looked through all my Lacan seminars on my bookshelf and uh, yeah. seminar four is the one that I don't own. Of course, <laughs> it's it's missing from its spot, <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. But um, I then looked it up online and I, I, I know what you mean, yeah. uh, kind of vaguely. But I honestly don't know why there is this kind of great divide between Lacanians and the, and the rest of critical theory people uh, on this particular issue. I don't really understand it. There are definitely people who are now trying to bridge that gap. Good. So Todd McGowan's latest book, which is on racism, is definitely it's a, an account of racism from a Lacanian perspective. I think it's going to be a very interesting book for people to read. And, uh, you know, Gail gave an, the example of the Lacanian scholar in critical race theory who had written a book that people were attacking. So it, for some reason, it has been very hard for Lacanians to engage with issues of social inequality in ways that are convincing to right. non-Lacanians. And I think Todd's book uh, does it quite well, does it beautifully and publishing him, I, I mean, not I am, but he's publishing his book in a series that I co-edit for Blue Okay, Press. gotcha. Yeah, so uh, I think it's an excellent book, and I'm hoping that it will kind of break some of those divisions that have been plaguing the field. I think right. for like no good reason, you have affect theorists like Sarah Ahmed going after Zizek and Babieu really strongly, like really accusing them of just being completely oblivious, which they sometimes sound like and they even, can sound like it yeah and even i do that in my book on levinas and lacan i'm kind of like Zizek, like why are you not paying attention to this mm -hmm. um yeah. uh, it's really frustrating and honestly i don't understand why it has been like that because it's not it's not antithetical to lacanian theory and it's not a complicated 
kind of a, a shift. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> not at all. So I, it's like, I don't know. It, maybe it's about the fact that most Lacanians, well, this is no longer the case. And that's really a good thing. Um, traditionally, traditionally, Lacanian theory has been a very white male field. And there you there, go. Okay. There may be just a fundamental kind of discomfort in speaking about things that maybe thinkers, theoreticians feel like they are not really experts on. They feel like maybe they shouldn't comment on something that they themselves have not experienced. So it's easier for a feminist woman to talk about sexism than it, than it might be for a random straight guy, white guy. Right. There are definitely now Lacanians, there have always been Lacanians, Lacanians of color who have tried to address racism, for instance, from a Lacanian perspective. But as Gail said earlier, there is some barrier, like there's some inability to cross over to other kinds of critical theoretical discourse so that people on the other side wouldn't get so upset at them. And I honestly don't really know why it's so difficult or why it has been so difficult historically. To me, it seems so kind of straightforward in a way. I mean, I don't mean that the topics themselves are straightforward. I just right. mean the ability to talk about those kinds of social inequalities, the ability to talk about those in the context of Lacanian theory, for me, is not difficult. And I don't really understand why it is so difficult for so many Lacanians. It's really sad because I think it creates these really unnecessary divisions. People who, in principle, are on the same side of the political divide, I mean, kind of left-leaning thinkers, end up fighting with each other over this issue instead of like blowing into the same, what's the expression, uh, kind of pulling together in the same direction. They are fighting right. each other, uh, just diffusing the left-leaning critical theoretical energy. And that's just really sad to me. I don't know what else to say about it. It's you, just you, kind of tragic. You do see it on the left, though. There can be a tendency to prefer infighting rather than yeah. than finding a, what Leotard might call a different to, to find a way in which discourses can bridge and find common ground. It's kind of like the way Gail described uh, it'd rather be a zero-sum game in the infighting where discussion has to be debate and it's not enough for me to win. Someone else has to lose. Right. Like that kind of thinking plagues is all too common. But as you said, hopefully that's just a more traditional type of Lacanian. I do think that the intersections of Lacanian theory and Marxism, that kind of blend can at least begin to make this inability to see different forms of lack antiquated because I think that that's, um, since I have already kind of taken up time, I, I do want to give Coop, Coop time. And uh, the only thing, the, the other things I had to say, I'll send to both of you via email because there was one thing that I saw in Simon Don that I thought worked well for Winnicott and, um, and Milner, but that's just my own kind of pet project in rehabilitating one of Deleuze's, you know, main sources. <laughs> so we can totally leave that out of the conversation. That's my personal Sterner and Dune, you know, Co Coop's the, the Dune Sterner guy. I'm kind of the Simon Dunn, Larwell, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, Coop, you can cut that out. I'm, I'm, I'm rambling. Well, that's funny because I was going to mention something earlier about body without organs and the partial objects and them sitting by side by side and how this could be like this dynamic between you know <laughs> like dissolving oneself while still having ah. these anchor points but i don't want to get into that um i wanted to read something from gail's chapter just to get a little auto theoretical myself i felt like this was a really interesting dynamic that maybe both of you could speak to in addition to i think this felt very relevant for the way that taylor and i conduct the podcast and our interactions but i'll go ahead and read the negative space of non-comprehension can actually facilitate a new kind of communication that transforms the relationship between two selves who are non-identical. A different kind of translation is activated in which the carrier of meaning is the process itself of translating rather than either the source language or the target language on their own. In the back and forth process that constitutes translation, new nuances are discovered in both languages as they glancingly coincide with and then diverge from one another. But I thought this was a very good kind of like, I think this very well spells out how Taylor and I work. And maybe even after Gail and, and Mari, I'd even be curious to hear your thoughts on this. But I don't know if this passage strikes you or the experience of working with one another creatively or even just both of your sort of takes on this passage. 
scale. It's a beautiful ba- passage. And it, re- it resonates with me intuitively, immediately, but I'm not mm-hmm. exactly able to like put my finger on why. But the back and forth process, translation activated in which the carrier of meaning is the process itself of translating rather than e- either the source or the target language mm-hmm. on their own. That's really interesting. Speaking very concretely, this is something that we actually have to, we want to put into the conclusion that we haven't yet um, Mm -hmm. written. We want to talk a little bit about what it has been like to co-author this book. I've done a couple of co-authored projects before. I I never used to co-author things. And then suddenly like four different projects landed on my lap or in my lap that all had a collaborative aspect. So this was not the first time. I am collaborating on a book, but this is the first time I'm doing it in this particular way where we both have a long independent chapter. Right. Okay. Um, I think that for me, what was kind of most amazing about the chance to write this book with Gail was the fact that we managed to be in Vienna at the same time when we started drafting our uh, respective chapters Mm -hmm. and, um, I didn't see her work and she did not see my work, but we met on a weekly basis to talk about some of the topics that we were writing about. And there was something about those conversations that very much fed the content of my chapter in Mm -hmm. indirect ways. And I don't know if the same was the case for Gail, but, but it definitely felt like an accumulative process where the weekly meetings that we had was an integral part of the process of writing the book and definitely kind of carried me in the sense that I tried my chapter very fast during the weeks that I was in uh, Vienna. And I think that being able to meet with Gail in person kind of just kept me going, made the process very sort of concrete. For me, it has been just an amazing, very productive, I don't mean productive in the neoliberal sense, but kind of (laughs) (laughs) worthwhile type of an endeavor in the sense that it gave a different kind of inflection to the the work of creativity. Generative, that's the word. (laughs) <laughs> yes. Yes. For me too, the, the time in Vienna was was key. Whenever I would turn back to the book, I would I would have very viscerally in mind uh, you know, the the cafes we were in when we were right. talking about whatever we were talking about. Uh, whatever I was working on. Unlike Mari, however, I did not draft mine very quickly. I basically drafted my chapter over the entire seven months of my mini sabbatical in Vienna mm-hmm. and into the summer. But I wanted to I want to sort of riff on or whatever the word would be, associate with this a passage that you read from my chapter a little bit. First of all, the idea of translation and, and language in, in the metaphorical as well as the literal sense is very fascinating to me in the Mm -hmm. the translation studies, you know, the debate, there are all kinds of different variations on it, but the debate has always been about how true to, or well, actually true is relevant to our, both of our interests in the notion of the true self, how true to the original language, the translation is. And, you know, we tend to think that the goal is to reproduce it as absolutely as perfectly and as directly as possible but some translation theorists have thrown that into the into question appropriately so i'm very attracted to this idea of process of translation another association i have is with um the psychoanalyst shandor ferency who's most mm-hmm. yeah. a sort of younger contemporary of freud he was analyzed by freud briefly mm-hmm wanted to have more analysis with Freud, but Freud didn't want to do it. That's a whole other <laughs> um, But he was also a colleague and he was one of the, he was one of the people to whom Freud repeatedly turned as he was shedding some of the other analysts like Jung, who right. Freud felt didn't adhere closely enough to the way psychoanalysis should be. And, and until the very end of his life, Ferency was the one Freud regarded as sort of a a rock, not a rock for himself so much, but could always count on as agreeing with him until until he didn't. It's kind of an interesting relationship in the context of what Mari was talking about in terms of the Lacanians, because to my mind, it wasn't so much the case that Ferency was disagreeing with Freud. They weren't talking about the same. They were talking in different registers, to go back to Mari's right. the beginning of the interview, they were talking in two different registers. And if Freud had only been able to understand that, he wouldn't have he wouldn't have found Ferency's 
ideas to be such an affront mm-hmm. to him. But the reason I'm bringing Ferency up is because he has this amazing article called Confusion of Tongues on the, uh, of course, I'm not going to get it exactly right, on the on misunderstandings between the adult and the child. So what I say here in this passage that you read is an antidote to what Ferency calls the confusion of tongues. Mm-hmm. In 1932, he gave that essay was written in 32 or 33. He gave, to my mind, the most perfect description of what abuse of all sorts looks like. Interesting. In terms of language, he says the the adult and the child speak different languages of love. The child speaks the language of tenderness, and the adult speaks the language of sex, seduction, and sexuality. And so in a situation of abuse, and it doesn't have to be about sexual abuse, it could be any kind of abuse, Mm -hmm. speaking two different languages is the key. Somebody makes an utterance in their language, and the other person reads it in terms of their own language. The adult reads the child sitting on his lap as a sexual gesture, when for the child, it's a gesture of tenderness. So that's the reading part of the mistranslation. Mm -hmm. And then the writing part, so to speak, or the speaking part, is that the person in power imposes their language, substitutes their language for the language of the person who's not in power, who has less power. Right. And takes it over and makes it into something else and thereby erases the child's relationship to their own language and their own their own way of being. Right. And it's terribly traumatic. This idea of having two languages, two people that glancingly converge and then glancingly and then diverge and then converge and diverge in a process seems to me to be a much more well, it's a process that allows each of them to come into being, to wait and listen, and then to speak, and then to withdraw, and then to reflect and think about who they are, and then think about who the other one is, and so forth. And it just seems like the best kind of counterpart or counterweight to the all too frequent prevalence of that kind of power based mistranslation that we do. The overcoding that happens from the the source of power, right? Yes, I love yeah. that word. That's a great word. Yeah. Do you mean like paint, or do you mean like coats? Oh, I mean like overcoding, right? Coding, like, even better. Coat. Yeah, yeah, but I, I can imagine uh, overcoating with with paint. But now I'm thinking of how yeah. you know there there needs in terms of translation, there needs to be an active decoding because we're never right. necessarily speaking exactly. the same code, even you know, between between two people, but even from any minute to another, but there needs to be an act of decoding that's done with care. And yep. I mean, without, when you're imposing the power, like in the despotic regime, you're yep. overcoding the code of the child, right? The person in power could that's be, right. could be doing that. And, and that renders in a certain way that it renders them uniform, but on the other hand, it imposes that in a sort of violence. So I, exactly, it's yeah. very violent, even on a, on a level that seems benign and and good. When somebody says somebody comes to me and is like, "Oh, I'm," or if I go to somebody, you go to somebody and they and you say, "Oh, well, I this really terrible thing happened to me," or I'm feeling really terrible, and the other person says, "I know exactly how you feel." Right. This happens so often. It's become like a pet thing of mine. So, or it doesn't even have to be something negative. You're in a conversation and somebody says, "Oh, I'm going on a trip," and they're like. Oh, I'm going on a trip. It's like, these are not the same thing. And why don't you just shut up and be curious about the other (laughs) instead of, I love this word, overcoding. Yes. With your own code. Yes. 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 Got it. My sister-in-law is exactly like this, where if you tell any bit of information or any story, she's going to either one up you or, and I think the reason why is her, my wife, she's seven years older than my sister-in-law, and uh, they have this dynamic where it's always there are type of people that that you may you may complain, make a small complaint, or you may have had a bad day, and they're going to tell you how their day was worse. It's always that kind of thing. Right. I don't even think it's malicious. I think that's just that's just how uh, 
This is how she is. But no, I, I and to go back to something you said, you know, in terms of translation, I just I do think that there needs to be room for more than just the main ideal of a sort of, you know, copy that can reproduce the original. There needs to be at least some ways of knowing that if you really just transpose this from if you transliterate it from one language to another, it's going to not sound authentic. So you have to have, you have to breathe some life back into it of idiomaticity. That's my view. And I try to keep those ideals balanced, but it's, um, it can be difficult. But I think that that's also not just in literary studies, but I think that there can be ways of, uh, even Lacan talks about the ways of misrecognizing. We sort of get what our our message back to us inverted. You know, the, he has this way of talking about these things that that shows that it's very much in uh, at play in not just in the analytic situation, but in everyday communication. We're back to lack. Yeah, like that- <laughs> we're back to lack. Right? That thing you say about transliterating or reproducing it is it's not possible. Yes, languages are different, despite the deep grammar that the structuralists say is in all languages, but they're very different in all kinds of ways. And I feel like what both of us are, I mean, one of the things that both of us are highlighting is the idea of embracing the lack, uh, recognizing that the lack exists, not necessarily embrace, but yeah, if the lack of, of congruence between two languages is is uh, yeah, it can be a problem, but it can uh, it is a problem when you're trying to translate. It's like a very real problem on a concrete concrete level. But it's it's also if it didn't exist, then that kind of thing that you're talking about, Taylor, of yeah. injecting something interesting into the mm-hmm. pro- what what emerges wouldn't be possible. Yeah, the the, the disparity allows for the creativity, right? Exactly. So I think that that's that's part of the the theme of of the work itself. And now I think that we can, I do want to hear, plug the book, talk a little bit about uh, your work when it's coming out and I'll leave you two to have the last word. Okay. Uh, We don't know when it's coming out because we have to first finish it uh, before we start uh, approaching publishers. I do, I do have an editor in mind um, that, um, Okay. Whom I'm going to approach, uh, uh, or we're going to approach when when we actually finish it. But like my chapter still needs uh, a few rounds of revision, as you noticed, it's really kind of rough. So in the next few weeks, we will hopefully finish it and then start looking for publishers. Um, I'm hoping that it won't be too difficult to find one for this particular book. Um, and uh, I guess my parting words. <laughs> about this book and maybe about my work generally speaking are that I think at the at the core of my thinking is always this basic Lacanian idea that if we accept the fact that this Lacan being that we all have within our being is something that cannot be cured cannot be fixed if we accept Mm -hmm. that kind of point of view or perspective on things, then that actually opens up a field of possibilities for Mm -hmm. directing your energies into things that you can actually change, Mm -hmm. that you can actually have some impact on so that you don't squander your energies in these pointless attempts to fill your lack or heal your being or become a whole person or something like that. But you start to actually work with your lack and you focus on things that are doable that you can do creatively with imagination, with passion, with innovative energy, all this stuff. So in some ways, at the core of my thinking is the idea that the very lack that we so fear is actually the springboard of all these wonderful possibilities um, for creative thinking and being in the world. And parting thoughts from you, Gail? First of all, I second the idea of the the lack or the undifferentiation or the unintegration as the mm-hmm. as the source of our creativity as a source of our creativity. I think you know the the sort of slogan I guess for my chapter is embrace the paradox, mm-hmm. uh, the paradoxical. I think one of the most important things that Winnicott said it was in the preface to playing in reality. 
his compilation of several of his essays was um, I'm asking for paradox to be embraced, respected, and not to be resolved. And he talks about the split, the, the, he quote this blight to intellectual functioning where we have, we feel compelled to choose one or another side of a paradox or a contradiction and feel very urgently about that. And I think about that need to resolve paradox. So it's hard for me to live. It's like my, it's like my ideal. I'm not saying that it's easy to live in a space of paradox and Mm -hmm. and, and ambiguity, but I feel based on my experiences in my own life and certainly my experiences in higher education, I think that there's an urgent need to try to live more fully and more quietly and openly in a space that that is ambiguous in feelings that are ambivalent and to be curious about the paradoxes that that life brings us uh, and I, you know, not to end on the negative, but it's this need to do this. I'm feeling it welling up in my students so much. They're searching, you know, people love to trash Generation Z, but I feel like Generation Z is like a touchstone generation for us all Mm. because they are, they've grown up in a world, if they were born in the late 90s or the early 2000s, they've grown up in the United States, at least, in a world that has been uniquely destabilized. It's like mm-hmm. America is entering its its late adolescence itself. It's like no more illusions that we're, we're whole and intact and the greatest and morally right. superior or anything else. And right. everything that these young people have experienced has, everything they've experienced has reinforced this idea mm-hmm. that catastrophe is around the corner that that institutions are not trustworthy that authority is bogus that morality is but but the interesting thing is that they are more ethically and morally and and passion driven than many generations before them and they i think are I, I know because I, I work with them all the time that they're they're urgently searching for models of the world and themselves that can be capacious and account for all the things that they see around them and are not going to try to pull the wool over their eyes mm-hmm. with something that says, do this and you'll be fine. Mm-hmm. Because they know that's not the case. So that's Sort of why I feel that that Milner and Winnicott's works are really, really timely right now, and uh, will hopefully we'll see <laughs> be well received. That's yeah, extremely yeah. powerful. Yeah, I, I think we're trying to speak to a specific zeitgeist of you know the neoliberal subject who has become this kind of a overly productive, performance-oriented, uh, self-improvement-oriented entity and trying to find an alternative for that. And I think that one of the things that Gail is uh, highlighting is the fact that people are looking for an al- alternative and it's just really difficult to find a vocabulary with which to talk about that. And for some right. reason, for some reason, psychoanalysis, at least for the two of us, seems to give uh, us that vocabulary, that ability to think about life in terms other than, you know, how can I improve my productivity? How can I improve this or that or whatever about my life? That it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be goal oriented. And it is about the process rather than about the objective ultimately. Right. So, yeah, I guess that's like, yeah, trying to find some alternative modality of living to the kind of life that a lot of us are leading at the moment and not really liking and we are Mm -hmm. we are privileged i mean we are hyper privileged university professors if we are having a hard time reconciling ourselves to the life that we are living then other people uh out there must be having an even rougher time and it's just there's something about the contemporary world that is just like jonathan lear has this wording uh too much of too much. There's something too much of too much about it. Just like, oh my gosh, 
get me out of out of this spiral of like over production over excess of everything mm -hmm. uh, the abundance of things that are coming at us that the, all the things that we could obtain if we wanted to at the same time as this, there's there's this immense pressure to um perform on a higher and higher and higher level constantly and i think for me also uh, it's interesting to think about the distinction between that type of kind of compulsion to be productive and to improve your performance on the one hand and then the creative urge on the other, which may actually look identical. So, you know, I keep publishing one book after another. So then I ask myself, well, does that mean that I have fallen in, in, into the neoliberal notion <laughs> of having to perform and perform and perform? And I thought, thought about that a lot in the context of this book. And I came mm -hmm. to the conclusion that it's not. It's a different kind of passion. I am being driven by passion that has nothing to do with the neoliberal injunction to perform what Marcus called the performance principle. I'm driven by jouissance, basically, by the drive. So yeah. like a passion translated into like everyday vocabulary. And that kind of passion is different from the neoliberal performance principle. But sometimes the line between those can be very blurry and right. It would be important for people to pay attention to their lives and to uh, lives and to think about, like, really make sure that they are being driven by passion rather than this other monstrous thing, at least monstrous for me, maybe not for everyone, but, but for me, it feels monstrous. I think for the four of us, perhaps we would all agree it's, <laughs> it, can, it can easily be monstrous. And, and Gail, you, you pointed out something that I think this is things that maybe off air more so, but Coop and I have talked about is just some of the things you brought out, Gail, about not just the new generation, but this sort of growing up and, and growing less and less disillusion. But, but I think that for them, you know, as much as each generation wants to, you know, disparage the next, I, I do think that you're right. There's this, there's a sense in being born in the 21st century. I can only imagine, you know, um, the acceleration of technology and all the different disillusionments you, you brought out. I mean, having that be the baseline means that, you know, perhaps then I think that the ideal perhaps would be a space for not just, you know, artistic creativity, but even like ethical creativity in the sense of not having, not necessarily being what, as you said, raised in in a time when, you know, there's still the Cold War and there's still this idea that America has won and, and it's great, it's the best country in the world. The fact that they're that they're not sort of a martyr with all this stuff that I think Coop and I grew up with being children of the 80s, that was still kind of the, the narrative that we grew up with. The fact that that's not there for them means that they're going to have to perhaps fill that, yeah. that ideological void with something hopefully... Better. Better. Yeah, Please, hopefully better. Better. I mean, yeah. I'm a child of the sick. I mean, I, I'm a child of the sixties. I grew up, I was born in 1954. And mm -hmm. so I, I grew up in the era that everybody's now like wanting to go back to. And I'm like, please, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. It was really a problem. And I think that <laughs> it was really a problem. I love. I that. mean, I don't want to, I don't want to get too personal about that, but, it, but you know, I just, the idealization of that, of that time, I mean, with all the other problems with the MAGAs and everything, the ideal is, sure, I guess if you're a white man, you know, working class, working class, middle class, you know, yeah. and stable, there, there were lots of ways in which that was a better time. And, and I think all of them, the only ways in which that was a better time from my non-professional opinion, in my non-professional opinion, is that it was pre-neoliberalism. Right. You know, for example, my father, who worked in sort of low middle management in a corporation, he had a pension, if you can right. imagine. Right. That my mother lived on until she died at 90, even after he died. He had a pension, just as if we were living in Western Europe, only it was right. it was, it was company based right. instead of state based. But we had in the United States something akin to the social democracy. Yeah. sort of a capitalistic version of the social democracy of Western Europe until the 80s. Right. And it was all wiped away. And since then, we're on our own. And the one of the things that I think is really interesting and just absolutely horrifying, but not surprising about what's going on right now 
in the world, in the United States and in the world, is the way in which that too much of too much, that too muchness of too much is being exposed like the Wizard of Oz Mm -hmm. as nothing. Because all of this, like you can have everything you want as quickly as you want, you know, overnight delivery. Right. Everything you could possibly want is not working anymore. Right. Because the the on time, you know, like the just in time approach to distribution and the just enough personnel to keep the airline going so that if one pilot isn't there, there's a cascade of canceled flights. Right. It, it's like yeah. this, we realize that this whole edifice of plenty and choice is built on nothing. Twitter. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it's all just collapsing now. And that collapse was always built into it. And so it's like the emperor has no clothes. I mean, all the different analogies we could have. <laughs> the other is empty. The other does not. Exist. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, and, gone. It's, it's the other is totally empty. Exactly. You, yeah. you, you made a good point. And I, and I don't want to necessarily keep us too much longer. But the, the one thing I wanted to respond to is there is this sense of the nostalgia for the post-World War II time, the 50s or whatever, don't conflate the nostalgia for at least a little bit of that safety net, pensions, and these other things, a, a better economic time with the values associated with that time. Because that's that's where there's a disconnect, where the nostalgia always seems to be about the values and not necessarily some of the less economic hardships that we might see today, You know, whether it be inflation or whatever. I think that too much isn't about like, hey, you know, there was a time when capitalism wasn't so harsh, but that is that really true? It just it just wasn't as as, you know, um, it just didn't seem so devastating in terms of, you know, minimum wage or whatever. But it was still it's still inherent in it was uh, the monstrosity that keeps growing. A- yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and I, I think I read this um, because I started realizing that I was just tossing around the word neoliberal all the time. You know, would, <laughs> something would like we'd be at the airport right. and the flight would be canceled. And I would turn to my husband and be like, neoliberal. <laughs> and, Neoliberalism. Um, and then I realized I really don't know what I'm talking about. And I, so I started researching it, be, you know, for this book. And, right. you know, not that I read economics academic articles, but I found this sounds, it's a little embarrassing to admit this, but I found this really amazing long article in the guardian Mm -hmm. that was a history of neoliberalism. And it was very, very helpful for me. And I think what you're saying here is really resonant with that because the sort of light bulb that went off for me of what the difference is between capitalism as it always was and where we are now, according to this guy, is that before Capitalism was an economic theory. So all of the economic stuff was, you know, capitalistic, mark driven to one extent or another, depending on the different schools of economics I, that I don't know about. But the decisions about societal, the sort of ethical, moral, political, social decisions were re- no economists had the notion that those should be made according to the same principles. Mm. Right. You make for, you know, market share or something like that. And the shift, what I guess what Hayek, this this founder of neoliberalism felt was that the principles of capitalism should be applied to everything in life. Right. Mm. And so that, you know, if the utilities were like, you know, gas, uh, gas and electric and telephone used to be public utilities and then they were deregulated. Right. Before deregulation, the thought was, well, this is a public good. It was a political decision. It's a public good. So we need to make sure that everybody can access electricity or telephone service. Mm-hmm. That was a political decision. Whereas, you know, the Reagans and the Thatchers of the world were like, deregulate it, let competition reign, substituting economic principles or capitalistic principles for political decisions right Mm -hmm. and this is exactly what Foucault is getting at when he talks about the homo economicus where Mm -hmm. everything about human life actually uh, becomes modeled after economics Uh, so 
the idea is that the more, more you uh, invest in yourself, the more you're going to reap the benefits ultimately. And uh, just touching back on what you were saying earlier, Gail, uh, what's happening right now is that people are realizing that they're actually not reaping the benefits. Right. You know, you're, you're making the investment, but you're not getting the, the benefits that you're expecting. So um, that's one reason that the system feels so overwhelming at the moment. It's interesting that we started with creativity and in this <laughs> and the fun stuff, and we've ended with why it's. But but I think it reiterates the point why what we discussed at the beginning is so important, and that there are these alternative modalities for sort of pursuing creative means. That the the reality of the situation we come to last, but I think that it doesn't take as much time to point out since it is what we're sort of enmeshed in. But I do want to remind the the, the listener that uh, don't forget all the the positive stuff that we discussed earlier. Just because we're pointing out the the, the harshness of the reality right now. No, but it actually makes perfect sense because uh, the whole premise of the book is to talk about alternatives to all the bad stuff that we have just talked yes. about. So, like <laughs> the first half of my chapter is about all the bad stuff. You yes, know, there there is. The explanation of uh, Homo economicus, there's mm -hmm. Adorno, Adorno's critique of it, uh, Foucault's yep. critique of it, affect theoretical critiques of it, cruel optimism, um, mm -hmm. pessimism, all, pessimism, all that. That kind of gets explained. The situation gets explained. And then we are trying to come up with the, the more positive stuff, which has to do with the creativity. So both of these are components of the book, but we kind of just talked about them uh, kind of in reverse. In, in reverse, exactly. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. Gail, do you want a, a last word? And then I think we will let, but if not, I do want to. I think that's a perfect last word. <laughs> Good. I do want to thank you for three hours of your time. I am so <laughs> pleased. I hope, hopefully it went by quickly because yeah, it did. I, I, I think the, the conversation we had was dynamic. I appreciate both of you. Thank you both again so much for your time and for discussing a work uh, and, and giving us the sneak peek right, of, of your yeah. forthcoming work. So um, thank you both, Marie, Gail. Thank you so much. And thank you. when it comes out, we'll have to, you'll have to let us know. And, you know, maybe if, if you have time, we can try to get you back on the show uh, sometime next year. Okay. So at the very cool. least we can have virtual champagne together. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for your, your time and uh, all the passion that you pour into this podcast. Yes. And oh, thanks well. for the links. To other texts that was really useful for me and i generally dislike science fiction but i'm i'm really close to being inspired to read dune, that <laughs> dune piece now we're gonna let you enjoy the rest of your weekend we're gonna stay on just to talk about what we're doing okay. next week but in two weeks i'll be sending both of you an email and have a have a wonderful weekend thank you, you. too okay. you too Bye. Thank you thanks very much bye bye, bye. Once again, thanks to Gail Newman and Mari Rudy for joining Taylor and I on this week's edition of the Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour. The very rules of eating, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is unconscious. Okay. The whole state of things, the pure violence without object. This is the typical violence of It's violent because what happens then is the murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Whitewashed, lobotomized people, as in a block work orange.